This web clip describes new directions in understanding the development of inhibitory control. My name is Yuko Munakata, and I am a professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Colorado Boulder. Children are notoriously bad at inhibiting inappropriate actions. This is important in the moment when you're trying to get children to stop doing any of these things, and it's important in the longer term. Inhibitory control in childhood predicts a range of important outcomes, including academic performance, social competence, health, wealth, and criminality. So there's been a lot of interest in attempts to intervene to improve inhibitory control in children, but so far they haven't been very successful. I'll talk about theoretical frameworks we've developed that provide a new way of thinking about inhibitory control, and I'll show how we've built on these frameworks to develop targeted interventions that improve inhibitory control in children. So I'll start with a theory, and there are two parts. The first is that children transition from a reactive form of control, engaged in the moment, on the fly, as they need it, to a proactive form of control, engaged in advance in anticipation of needing it. Most developmental theories of cognitive control, including mine, had assumed that proactive control develops from infancy. But more recent work suggests that instead of kids just getting better and better from infancy at this adult form of proactive control, they instead shift from a reliance on a reactive form of control to the addition of a proactive form of control. As one example from my lab, we presented children with the child-adapted version of the AXCPT task where they were presented with a series of stimuli and they were instructed to respond when they saw one particular sequence, an A followed by an X, in this case, a SpongeBob followed by a watermelon. So when SpongeBob was followed by the watermelon, they were instructed to hit this happy face. And these trials occurred the majority of the time, so that hitting the happy face was the prepotent response in this task. On all other sequences, so SpongeBob followed by the Slinky, or Blue followed by the Watermelon or the Slinky, they were instructed to hit the sad face, and in that case they needed to engage cognitive control to overcome the prepotent response of hitting the smiley face. We know from work with adults that adults can proactively maintain cue information to prepare their response. So at the point in time where they see the cue here, they can begin to prepare In the case of SpongeBob, they can begin to prepare uh, to hit the happy face since that's the most likely outcome. And in the case of Blue, they can prepare to hit the sad face. When we tested children in this task, we found that eight-year-olds looked very much like adults in showing proactive profiles of responses, preparing at this point in time when they saw the cue for the most likely response. In contrast, eight-year-olds showed a strikingly different pattern. They showed no signs of proactively trying to maintain information about the cue or prepare in response to it. Instead, they seemed to encode that information and then retrieve it only when necessary if they needed to engage control later on at the point of the probe. We saw this behavior in a number of, uh, in a number of measures. As one example, we measured pupillometry as an index of the mental effort that children were expending during this task, during the cue period when they saw SpongeBob or Blue, across the delay, and when the probe was presented. We saw that eight-year-olds showed their big burst of effort during this delay period, after SpongeBob or Blue had been presented, and they could begin preparing their, their uh, response at that time. Three-and-a-half-year-olds, in contrast, showed only a brief burst of effort at that time period, shown here in black, when they needed to encode that information, but then showed no signs of sustained effort across the delay period in preparation for what was to, what was to come. Instead, it was only at the point when they received the probe information, um, in particular on BX trials, so when they had seen blue followed by a watermelon, and the watermelon might trigger their prepotent response of hitting the happy face, it was only then that they showed this big burst of effort when they needed to retrieve the information that it was actually blue that had been seen to overcome their prepotent response of hitting the happy face. So these kinds of patterns suggest that uh, eight-year-olds proactively prepared for what was to come, whereas three-and-a-half-year-olds only retrieved that information as it was needed. So children show this transition from reactive control at three and a half years to proactive control at eight years. So how is this relevant to inhibitory control? Well, the second part of the theory is that proactive monitoring processes play a critical role in response inhibition. Many signatures of response inhibition from fMRI, ERP, and behavioral studies have been interpreted in terms of stopping actions per se. But more recent work suggests that these signatures may instead reflect proactive monitoring of the environment for cues to update actions. 
Much of this work has been conducted using the stop signal task, which is viewed as a quintessential response inhibition task. But it also taps proactive monitoring processes. To give you a flavor for this, I'll have you try it. I'd like you to raise your left hand when you see left pointing triangles on the screen. Raise your right hand when you see right pointing triangles on the screen. Respond as quickly as possible, but try not to respond if you hear a tone. Ready? So the stop signal task is viewed as a quintessential response inhibition task because you need to override planned or ongoing prepotent motor responses. And this process is thought to be effortful and to tap prefrontal cortical regions, including the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. But this task may also tap proactive monitoring. You may have sensed that you weren't just passively doing the task, you can also proactively monitor for the tone via active maintenance of the goal of stopping or of the stop signal itself. To test these kinds of ideas, we had subjects do two versions of this task. One was similar to the one you just did, where they pressed their left finger for left arrows, their right finger for right arrows, responded as quickly as possible, and tried not to respond if they heard a tone, the classic stop signal task, <clears throat> or they did all these same things, but they were told to respond again if they heard a tone, a double go task. And the idea was that if all of these signatures of effort and uh, prefrontal involvement, etc., reflect stopping per se, they should be seen in this version of the task, in the stopping version, but not in this double-go version. Whereas if the demands were more about the overall monitoring processes, proactively monitoring for these tones that signaled a change in response, then you should see those signatures across both the stopping and the double-going version of the task. And what we found uh, across a number of studies is that monitoring rather than stopping seemed to explain the response inhibition signatures. As one example, in an fMRI version of this task, we found that the stopping version of the task reliably activated the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, replicating a lot of prior work. But this region was similarly activated for that double go task. The purple region shows the overlap between the stop task uh, in red and the double go task in blue. So this, these kinds of findings suggest that the prefrontal involvement in this task is not for stopping per se, but rather for a proactive monitoring process of monitoring the environment for relevant cues that signal the need to change action. So these two parts of the theory, that children transition from a reactive to proactive form of control across development, and that proactive monitoring processes play a critical role in response inhibition, suggest a new way of understanding why children struggle with inhibitory control. The idea is that when one child is about to hit another, the problem is not just in the actual act of stopping uh, that, that hit, um, but also requires proactive monitoring of the environment for relevant cues that signal the need to stop an ongoing action. For example, uh, proactively monitoring for the look on the other child's face or perhaps for the presence of a nearby adult. These ideas also suggest new ways of intervening to try to improve inhibitory control in children. The one I'll focus on here is the approach of trying to train proactive monitoring in children. We did this in a study with seven to nine year olds where they were tested in their inhibitory control on the stop signal task. In this version, children were told that they should press a banana to feed it to a baby monkey, um, but on some trials, this banana would turn brown and baby monkey doesn't like those. And so children were told that they should not press those bananas. Before children went into the stop signal task, they were trained in uh, various ways. In the stopping condition, children received practice actually stopping ongoing actions. In this case, they were told that they should press this plane to make it land, um, but on some trials, the weather would turn stormy, and so the children should not press those planes to make them land because it was too dangerous to land. So uh, in this case, children received actual experience uh, with uh, engaging in pressing actions and also experience in stopping those pressing actions. We tried to minimize the extent to which they needed to proactively monitor for cues to stop those actions um, by making those cues very obvious. So in this case, where the storm appeared, the entire screen turned uh, dark and there was a loud uh, thunder noise. 
That was one kind of training that children received. In another condition, children received practice proactively monitoring for relevant cues in the environment. So here they were told that they should press bananas when they appeared to feed them to George. But on some trials, those bananas would turn brown. And in those cases, the children should quickly press the banana again to make it go away. So this is very much like the double go condition in the study I just described earlier, where children are learning to proactively monitor for these relevant cues of the banana being pressed, but instead of stopping, the children actually complete their ongoing action and go again. And what we found is that practice with motoric stopping improved children's inhibitory control relative to a control condition where children were exposed to the same kind of stimuli um, and had experiences of going but did not have any practice stopping or monitoring. What's plotted here is their modal stop signal reaction time, which is an estimate of how quickly subjects can stop, where lower values mean better inhibitory control. So we found that practice with motoric stopping helped children's inhibitory control relative to a control condition. But we found that practice with proactive monitoring helped children even more. Uh, so their inhibitory control was best in this condition after they had practiced proactively monitoring for this relevant cue of the banana changing color. This helped them even more despite the fact that this proactive monitoring group had learned to actually go again in response to this signal. The analogy I like to use for how counterintuitive and compelling this finding is, is thinking about going back to that example of one child hitting another. The idea here is that if you wanted to, to help children to inhibit uh, their hitting of other children, what this intervention suggests is that you could teach them to proactively monitor for relevant signals in the environment, like the presence of another adult, or even better, uh, the look on the child's face who's about to be hit. Um, and the analogous intervention here would suggest that they should learn to watch for those cues, and when they detect them, they should uh, hit the other child twice. This is not something I'm condoning. Um, I just use this analogy to highlight how, how compelling this intervention is, that we're training kids to actually learn the wrong response um, in, in uh, association with these cues, but that seems to help them anyways because it's so important for them to learn to monitor for these cues in the first place. So inhibitory control is important in the moment and in the longer term. Our work suggests that we can build on theory to develop targeted interventions. These interventions in turn inform theoretical debates, for example, about developmental changes in the temporal dynamics of control and about the importance of proactive monitoring and response inhibition. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, current and recent graduate students and postdocs from my lab who have played a major role in developing and testing these ideas and the grant agencies who have funded this work. Thank you very much.